We're going to step back and look at some of the broader macroeconomic questions posed by the coronavirus and all the stimulus from governments and central banks that we're seeing and what that means for crypto markets. And also taking a look at some of the simmering geopolitical questions, uh, including what some people say is uh, potentially a new space race or a Cold War uh, between the U.S. and China and potentially uh, having the um, uh, digital currencies be a part of that competition between the United States and China. So let's bring on our next guests. We have Matthew Graham, CEO of Sino Global Capital, a crypto fund based in Beijing. Welcome, Matthew. And we also have Nicholas Merton, CEO and founder of Data Dash, uh, the largest cryptocurrency YouTube channel, he sa- he, which has over 330,000 subscribers. Welcome, Matthew and Nicholas. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it, Brad, as well as you, Camila. Nice being with you, Matthew. Thank you. Well, Matthew, Thank you let's very just much. start. Nice let's to be with you here today. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Um, Matthew, let's let's start with you just on the having again. What's your perspective on the having? Sure. So with respect to the having, we have continued to think that this is a, a moderately bullish event. You can't really compare it to previous havings, but it's uh, it's a, a supply and demand shock. It's certainly interesting in, in that regard. We, we tend to be uh, more fo- focused on longer term trends, but it's uh, it's definitely good for for tra- for um, more short term traders. How about you? The, the much more interesting say? thing, though, is the the Paul oh. Tudor Jones. Go ahead. There's a there's a five second delay, I think, because of uh, <laughs> the firewall and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So just to speak on, on your question, Camilla, in this case about the having event, uh, I, I like to take it from a very big macro perspective. So on my channel, I usually come from a background in this case of traditional markets. And I always like to see where capital is going to flow in and out of. I think the having event is really coming at a culminating time. I think the general thing that a lot of people have already brought up is that obviously central banks printing a ton of money gives a lot of markets and a lot of opportunities to possibly increase in value. I mean, obviously, most markets are going to adjust to this mass inflation or the great monetary inflation that we're experiencing right now across the Fed, the ECB, the Bank of Japan, and the Bank uh, People's Bank of China. But the more broader question that I always like to bring up in regards to something like Bitcoin is why would Bitcoin go up as an asset more comparative to, say, stocks, properties, other types of asset classes? And I don't think that answer really gets uh, you know provided by a lot of people. So one thing that I always like to share is really why I believe Bitcoin can act as a hedge during this time period. As you mentioned with COVID-19 and all this printing from central banks, there's really two markets that are going to get hit in this case. You're obviously going to see uh, you know, asset markets go up, property values and stocks are going to continue rallying like they have for the last few years. You don't want to bet against the central bank printing money. But there are two markets that are going to be hurt even more than they've already been hurt over the last few years since 2008. That is savings accounts and government bonds, and more specifically, U.S. Treasuries. So these are multi-trillion dollar markets. In the United States alone, there's a $9.2 trillion market for deposit accounts. So that's money sitting in a savings account right now that's earning nearly nothing. Uh, And along with that as well, you have a treasury market that's tens of trillions of dollars, as well as the broader government bond market, which is another few ten trillion dollars across the world. And the problem with the current environment with central bank monetary policy is that you have not only excessive printing, but you have negative interest rates that are becoming a reality. I think, you know, if you would have probably brought this up to any of us here on this panel, the idea that negative interest rates would become a possibility in the U.S., I think we would have thought it was it sounded crazy. At the end of the day, but now we're getting to a point where treasury yields uh, have teetered onto negative territory for the first time in the United States. Uh, we've started to see people's savings accounts rates drop from an already measly 0.09% down to 0.07%, just one step closer to inevitably having no yields and possibly a negative yield for saving your money. This is already a, ra- a reality in Europe and Japan. So it's becoming a, a global phenomenon in this case that's going to become more and more negative on the average everyday person who has either retirement funds and uh, you know T-bills or in traditional government bonds, or they have savings in their savings account. So there's a mass amount of dollars here that need to inflow into some market. 
And I think that Bitcoin is going to be that market because of three simple principles. It's completely separate from any government or central bank monetary policy. And to be more specific, you can't print Bitcoin into oblivion. You can create a lot of altcoins, but you can't you know, inflate the actual base supply of Bitcoin outside of its standard fixed model. And along with that as well, Bitcoin doesn't penalize you for holding it. It surely doesn't yield you anything like, for example, a dividend on stock, but it doesn't penalize you for owning it. And those two core features are going to be a huge reason why Bitcoin benefits in this environment. Yeah, no, that's, um, that's super interesting what you were uh, mentioning about, you know, how, how this environment might, might spur uh, investment in Bitcoin and, you know, uh, not only uh, develop, developed economies are slashing interest rates, but so are developing markets and you know investors who who had their 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 money in those bonds and, and stocks might also be driven away from from those markets and you know possibly uh, a, a percentage of, of that money could go into into crypto um but matthew wanted to you know we cut you off uh of talking about paul tudor jones i definitely want to hear your thoughts on the significance of this Matthew, can you hear us? Well, um, Nicholas, uh, maybe we can throw that one to you. Um, yeah. <laughs> do we, I don't see. Uh, well, do we have, Matthew, are you there? Okay, Matthew's back. Can you hear us? Matthew? Right, sorry about that. Uh, there's a quite a crackdown on VPNs recently. Yes, oh, there's no. quite a crackdown on VPNs with the upcoming political meetings here in China. So, uh, mm. very unfortunately, the uh, the signal is uh, intermittent. I do have to climb the Great Firewall here. <laughs> <laughs> well, did you hear Cammy's question? I, I did not. I'm. Okay, so we, we were we were asking about you know Paul Tudor Jones. We cut you off there, so interested to hear your thoughts. Okay, well uh, we keep tapping. Matthew appears to be uh, battling the Chinese. <laughs> yeah, Nick, wh why why don't you go with that? Yeah, so so Paul Tudor Jones, you know, I, I follow Paul Tudor Jones as well as many other different investors uh, over the last few years as I was exploring traditional markets. I think someone like Paul Tudor Jones coming in, even though as I think some people have mentioned earlier on, uh, coming in at a time you know where there's the having event, but also coming in to be more conservatively in futures contracts, I still think it speaks to the nature of institutional interest. Because people start to realize, as we started to see in gold markets, you know, we've seen gold top back to a $10 trillion market cap for the entire market. I think we're going to start seeing people respect the idea of Bitcoin serving as an alternative hedge. Uh, not only for those principles that I discussed a little bit earlier, but also understanding more and more the having model. And this is one thing that I, I like to bring up too, that is a big misconception, I think, in the crypto space. A lot of people think, you know, you know, markets are so efficient that the Bitcoin having event is already priced in, right? So like right now, we just had the having event happen a couple of hours ago. It was a pretty historic moment. You know, it only happens every four years. A lot of people think that it's already priced in. And I make a very big counter argument that it isn't. And there's a reason for this. You can make the same exact argument that the having was should have been priced in back in the second having event and the first one. And it wasn't. Right, Bitcoin continues to make parabolic rallies, and the reason why is the vast majority of the world meets into two, one of two categories: either they don't own Bitcoin, or in an even larger category, they may own Bitcoin, but they don't understand the having event. They don't understand the having model that Bitcoin has, and because of this, it's going to take a material amount of time for this to actually showcase some price. Uh, so, one thing that I always talk about with markets is that we're dealing with a constant rate of inflows and outflows. Inflows being buyers who are injecting new liquidity in the system. So, that could be the savers or the owners of T bills that are, are eventually selling their capital or getting their dollars out of the bank and now putting it into a new asset like Bitcoin. And you also have sell side pressure. So, you have general people who might have been speculating on Bitcoin and wanted to sell it. And you also have the pressure, which makes up the majority of the sell side pressure on a daily basis, which is miners. So what happens in a having event here is you have a great reduction in the amount of dollar volume of Bitcoin being sold on the market on a daily basis because of the having event. You now only have, instead of 12.5 Bitcoin being created every uh, 10 minutes on average, you have 6.25. So this greatly reduces millions of dollars of sell-side pressure. 
It's going to shut off a lot of miners, but in, in reality, it's actually a big benefit for Bitcoin because that supply chain, uh, that supply and uh, demand dynamic between buyers and sellers starts to favor the buy side and the bulls start to outweigh the bears in this case, pushing price higher. Um, for prices to remain relatively stagnant or where they are, you need an equalization between the buying and the selling. And we're not, we're basically over the next couple of months going to start to see a growing divergence of the bulls and the buyers starting to weigh out the sellers until we start to get towards the later phase of the cycle where things start to go parabolic and people start to really take in profits. Hey, Nicholas, um, you know, just oh, we've got Matthew back. Uh, well, Matthew, can you hear us now? Yes, yeah. Now that we've established that China is complicated, we can continue. <laughs> well, let's try to hit you on a China-related question. We teased uh, earlier in the show that we were going to have you on. And, and uh, now what about, what, what, just give us your high-level view of kind of whether digital currencies represents kind of a new space race or a new front in what a, what a lot of people are thinking is a new cold war between the China, between China and the United States. Sure. So I, I think there's a lot to unpack there. I would phrase it thusly from the China perspective. It is uh, a space race. It, blockchain is viewed as a strategic technology in the same vein as 5G, as AI, as other similar technologies. And that starts from the uh, national level government down. And uh, so from that perspective, it is a space race, but from the U.S. and probably the Western perspective, it's not. So we, we have an asymmetrical space race right now, which is uh, which I, I think is, is a, a useful starting point. The second point that I would make is I, I think long term, there's a real danger that uh, we could have uh, a bifurcated blockchain world to some extent, much like after years of the internet developing, we in many ways have a bifurcated uh, internet world. And I think we're starting to see some early signs of, uh, of two different worlds emerging from one. So I, I, I think there are, there's a real danger of that. And I wanted to mention that as well. And what role would uh, China's, like a national digital currency from, from China play, play in there? In, in that divided world? So I, I think it would play a huge world. It's uh, a huge, <clears throat> excuse me, a huge role. It's obviously important to understand that uh, DCEP is not blockchain in any real sense of the word. It's not blockchain in, in the way we use uh, that word. And it's certainly not crypto. Um, basically, you can think of it like this. Uh, so currently, uh, for many people, including myself, I, I have not carried a wallet in probably more than two years here in China because you don't need to. Your phone is your wallet. And so you have Alipay, which is Alibaba, and you have uh, Tencent's WeChat Pay. And that's probably 99.9% .9 of my daily non-crypto transactions. That's true for many people, right? So DCEP then becomes a third part of that uh, of that world. So you have, you would then have, uh, uh, WeChat pay, Alipay and DCEP. So it's, it's, it's basically more, if you had the, the U S analogy would then be maybe Apple pay, uh, only now it becomes, uh, it becomes government, uh, and it, be uh, uh, and it becomes fiat, it becomes, it becomes government, uh, backed current digital currency, right? Uh, and I, I think it's going to become a, a huge part of this story, but that's more about attacking U.S. dollar hegemony than anything crypto directly. So there are a lot of nuances here. Right. Matthew, you know, if you look at some of the big players in crypto, Binance, Bitmain, yeah. you know, some of the big yeah. makers of equipment, yeah. It just seems like maybe China is ahead in technology, but obviously there's a ton of work going on here in the United States as yeah. well. I'm curious, from your perspective, which of the two countries is kind of in the lead on these technologies? That's a great question. I would phrase it thusly. I think you have to look section sector by sector. 
So for example, obviously uh, mining is very China centric and that goes both for, uh, for the hardware producers and the miners themselves. Um, on the other hand, I, I think for decentralized finance, Europe and the United States is, uh, is very far ahead and, and with similar uh, applications in terms of the, the development and things like that. Uh, also, I would say the sophistication of the funds with quantitative strategies and things like that tends to be very Western. But um, in terms of uh, enterprise blockchain, I think the, the West continues to be kind of in a cooling phase, uh, whereas that's very much heated up in China. So you, you really have to look sector by sector, enterprise blockchain, anything related to the government, that's China, anything hardware or with miners themselves, that's China. Uh, some of the, the development tends to be more uh, uh, Europe and the US along with the funds. Okay, well, Matthew, uh, th th I'm glad we finally got you back because it was super interesting what you just said. <laughs> yeah. um, all right, well, we're gonna have to end it there. And uh, Nicholas, Matthew, thank you both so much for, so uh, much joining for us here. Thank you. Thank you guys. Appreciate you. it.